Picture the Hyborian Age, now forgotten and undreamed of save in the pages of Nemedian Chronicles and in the deeds of its greatest heroes. At the zenith of their power, the mighty kingdom of Aquilonia and its fellow Hyborian neighbor states stood nearly without rival, having absorbed and assimilated countless tribes and nations to build a civilization out of the barbarism that had carried them from their northern homeland so unstoppably. However, the Hyborians were not the first peoples in history with expansionist ambitions. Many generations ago, Stygia, ancient land of serpents and sorcerers, had sent its own colonists east and north across the Styx, founding new kingdoms under the rule of Stygian sorcerer kings. Although the Hyborian conquests had destroyed the Stygians 3,000 years before the coming of Conan, the ghosts of this Stygian past did not always sleep quietly among the desert ruins. In today's video, a thief's folly unleashes a long-dead sorcerer king on an unsuspecting world. Not always so bad, since sorcery has its uses. We've got one case today, our sponsor Squarespace, who'll summon you up a home for your online community, perfect if you want to form a magic cult to conquer the world, or maybe you're just running a D&D campaign about it, probably easier. On Squarespace, you can now create gated, members-only portals on your website to house your group in a way that's both easy and private. They allow you to manage your members, do bulk emailing, get audience insights, and generate revenue through your content. Once people are in, you can use it like a blog or social network. There's a fully integrated comment system with threads, replies, and likes, allowing engagement with your main content or with blogs you can create with powerful internal tools. Plus, you can easily cross-post with existing social media accounts both ways. If you need higher-level features for your dark cult, you can use Squarespace extensions, third-party tools that let you manage inventory, marketing, bookkeeping, tax, and shipping from within the same system. And I guarantee you it's the tax management that holds most dark cults back. The best way to start is by using our special offer. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash wizardsandwarriors to save 10% off your first website or domain. This story begins in the ruins of Kuthchemis, a once Stygian satellite state, founded southeast of the land of Shem, back when Stygia still ruled over its pastoralist inhabitants and dominated the uplands beyond. Though destroyed along with its neighbor kingdoms by the still barbarous Hyborians of that bygone age, the last king of Kuthchemis, the feared sorcerer Thugra Kotan, would go out on his own terms rather than those of his conquerors. As his city burned, he consumed a deadly ritual poison, his black heart going still as his acolytes sealed him into the impregnable tomb he had prepared for himself, and though the Hyborians raised Kuthchemis to the ground, no amount of effort by the barbarians could crack the tomb's ensorcelled walls or open their way to the treasure within. As the years drew on, the Hyborians and Shemites alike steered clear of the cursed ruins, with only thieves and madmen paying heed to the legend of Thugra Kotan, the first out of lust for his treasure, the hunt for which claimed the lives of many a foolhardy tomb robber and the latter through the degenerate cults of devotees which clung to life over the centuries, deifying the fallen wizard king and awaiting his return. Yet one day, a thief of a different caliber arrived in Kuthchemis, Shivetes, a master thief of Zamora, luckier and more skillful than most. Where so many had turned back in failure or perished before him, he came armed with long-forgotten secrets and an incantation of opening gleaned from thieves' tales and cultists' chants over many perilous adventures. Narrowly avoiding death at the fangs of the tomb's ancient serpent guardian, he opened the ancient tomb, revealing the vast treasures of Thugra Kotan inside. But the only reward Shivatas would take from this success would be a grisly death at the hands of Thugra Kotan himself, preserved in undeath for 3,000 years and now free to take vengeance on the descendants of his conquerors. Emerging from the ruins and styling himself a prophet under the name of Natok, he seized leadership of dozens of nomad tribes, sweeping murderously northwest through the city-states of Shem and growing in power with every conquest. Some Shemite rulers tried to negotiate or to oppose him and were slain by sorcery or by force of arms. Kutaman, a rebel Stygian prince, joined his army to Natox, 
expecting to find an easily manipulated desert warlord to win himself a throne by, only to find himself the party being dominated. Unstoppably, the growing desert army worked its way towards the kingdoms of the Hyborians, with tiny Koraja its first target. Koraja had problems of its own already. With its king held for ransom in Ophir after a failed mission to secure that kingdom's aid, and its larger neighbour Koth planning a takeover, rulership during a time of crisis lay in the hands of the king's sister, the young and untested Princess Yasmela. With so much of the kingdom's army and nobility despairing of Koraja's prospects, and accepting Kothian gold for their loyalty, it was in large part the mercenary soldiers of General Amalric, among them Conan of Cameria, older and more experienced since his time in Makalet and serving as a captain of the spearmen, who upheld the defence of the kingdom. But no mere soldiers could protect Yasmela from the attentions of Natok, who nightly sent his shadow to stalk the princess's bedchambers, tormenting her by declaring her his queen-to-be and describing in lascivious detail the life that awaited her. In desperation, Yasmela turned to an unlikely source for guidance, Mitra, the god of her Hyborian ancestors, long since abandoned in Koth and Karaja for Ishtar and other deities of the land's Shemite majority. Led by one of her serving girls to Mitra's temple by night, the princess heard the voice of the god of her forebears instruct her to save her kingdom by placing its defense in the hands of the first man she met on the moonlit city streets. Departing the temple without guard or escort, she found none other than Kona outside an alehouse, leading the confused North man back to her palace, where instead of the tryst with a palace maid in waiting he expected, he was named commander of Karaja's army. The naming of a rowdy foreign mercenary as commander, seemingly on the princess's whim, was met with opposition, of course. Count Thespides, leader of Karaja's knights, and a suitor to the princess, would be especially opposed, but he begrudgingly accepted the Northman's leadership on the princess's order. With discontent still simmering, Conan marched out with the kingdom's armies to meet Natok at the Pass of Shamla, a narrow pass through the steep hills and cliffs that separated the Kothian highlands from the deserts of eastern Shem two days' march from Karaja. The site of an ancient Stygian ruin, a well-worn caravan road, and the path by which countless armies had marched in ages past, they were guarded and patrolled by the Zahimi clan, one of the many tribes on the kingdom's outskirts that swore fealty to the crown of Karaja. Camping on the plateau at the top of the long, steep valley that made up the pass, with a well and several stone archers towers to aid the defence, Conan's forces were bolstered by some 3,000 archers from the loyal hill tribes, leaving him with an army of 12,000 strong in total. From the regular Karajan army came 500 pikes, 5,000 archers and 500 knights under Thespides, joined by a thousand mercenary horsemen, twice as many mercenary spearmen, and the previously mentioned tribal archers. With the narrow pass held by spearmen, and Conan's bow-heavy army commanding the cliffs and ridges surrounding it, the pass would be a difficult obstacle to force, even for an army as large as the approaching horde, claimed by Natok to number a hundred thousand, with the Stygian chariot archers and Kushite horsemen of Kataman's rebel army racing ahead of the nomad and Shemite warriors of the Desert Prophet. The Karajan's morale would also be bolstered by the presence of their princess, still haunted by the knightly apparitions of Natok, now taking ever more horrifyingly lifelike appearance as the undead sorcerer drew closer. She had chosen to accompany the great army on its march, rather than await the spectre in the cold loneliness of the palace. Leaving her great pavilion to stay in the commander's tent, under Conan's vigilant protection, she slept without fear or nighttime visitors for the first time since the opening of Kuthjami's. Conan had his own problems of command, though, even with the princess's blessing and presence. Despite the massively greater numbers of Natok's horde, Thespides demanded they be met head-on, his ideas of chivalry and his noble-born disdain for his foes leaving him sorely underestimating the danger faced by Karaja and her army. On Conan's refusal, he split off with his knights to camp in the valley rather than with the rest of the army on the plateau, an empty gesture on its own, but foreshadowing further mutiny by the proud count against his low-born commander's orders that would nearly spell his homeland's doom. 
there would be little time for petty arguing over authority, however. The army had scarcely had time for a midday meal after their arrival at the pass, when the first signs of Natok's approach began to show. A great plume of sorcerous mist rolling up the valley towards the defenders, concealing the approach of the horde. The undead mage was facing a cannier general than the likes of Thespides, though. Though the approaching army was veiled from his sight, the wilderness-trained Conan easily picked up the approaching Stygian chariots by the vibrations in the ground, ordering his men to attention from their food and revelry to strap on arms and brace for the enemy's arrival. As soon as he did so, the mist dissipated from existence to reveal the approaching horde in all its fearsome splendor, as though his seeing through the attempted surprise attack had pierced the physical mist as well. Left suddenly exposed, the horde began to wheel about in confusion, the chariots splitting off from the army to leave the Kushite light cavalry milling about in disarray. By all appearances the trick had failed, and a crushing cavalry charge by courageous knights would be all it would require to start the enemy routing, as Count Thespides was quick to point out. The speed with which the first ruse was abandoned led Conan to suspect a second, though. Concerned his foe's confusion might be feigned to lead him into a trap, he forbade Thespides from charging them, ordering his troops to keep their defensive positions. But seeing Conan's prudence as cowardice, and perhaps hoping to win Yesmela's hand through a glorious victory of his own making, Thespides abandoned his commander to rejoin his knights, leading them in a mighty headlong charge down the steep valley. Their charge would come to nothing but disaster, once Natok showed his undead face on the battlefield for the first time. Racing across the valley perpendicular to the onrushing knights, the undead king worked sorceries not seen since the height of Stygia's power, scattering strange silver powder in a line across the valley in the knight's path before riding out of sight. Just moments before their charge should have impacted the Kushites like a hammer, the frontmost horses rode through the powder, setting off a great explosion that killed knights by the dozens and reduced the whole charge to a burning mass of chaos and death. This was the only signal the army behind it needed. Shedding their feigned confusion, as Conan had feared, they turned to advance up the valley, mercilessly slaughtering the surviving knights. In one fell swoop, Karaja had been shorn of much of its nobility and one of its strongest assets, with the soldiers behind thrown almost into panic by the sight of the massacre. Though Conan was able to prevent a rout thanks to his commanding presence and rally his frightened forces to the defense, the battle had only just begun, and the Karajans would soon be sorely pressed. Dismounting from their horses and chariots for the close quarters fighting to come, Kutamun's Kushites and Stygians pressed forward through the hail of Karajan arrows to clash with the mercenary spearmen in the pass, choking the valley with their dead as arrows and boulders rained down, but still driving the defenders back through sheer numbers and through vast arrow volleys of their own. Following them were the Ashuri, the soldiers of the 15 conquered Shemite city-states, filling the gaps in the Stygian lines as they killed and died against Amalric's mercenaries. As the fighting grew thicker and fiercer, Conan fighting like a madman on the front lines, it soon became clear that the enemy's numbers were insurmountable, and defeat was inevitable if Conan could not pull off a trick of his own. Interrogating one of his loyal Zahimi tribesmen in the thick of battle, he learned of the existence of another narrow and hidden trail, unknown to most, that wrapped around the valley's western ridge to let out behind the press of Natok's forces. Placing the surprised youth in charge of General Amalric and his thousand mercenary cavalry, the desperate Conan ordered them to take the pass and launch an attack from behind. As they vanished from the field, Conan returned to the defense, as his forces melted and panicked around him. Shupras, war leader of the hill tribes, lay dead already, and the mercenary pikes were wavering. Unfortunately for the beleaguered defenders on the pass, Amalric would not be reaching the enemy rear unopposed, with a small screening force of nomad horsemen patrolling the outer valley, encountering and attacking them as they rushed out of the secret pass. Outnumbered and outmatched as these desert scouts might have been, every minute of delay this engagement caused brought the mercenaries and hillmen above closer to defeat. As long minutes passed and the battle grew ever more bloody, 
Amalric and his horsemen's charge failed to materialize, leading Conan to turn to his last remaining asset, the 500 Karajan spearmen, held thus far in reserve, to pull off his most desperate gambit yet. Like most Hyborian kingdoms, Karaja saw the mounted knight as the only truly honorable military occupation, and her spearmen represented the destitute sons of diminished noble families, unable to afford horses and plate armor, their very service a humiliation. At the Battle of Shamla Pass, however, they would all get a chance at the glory their poverty had denied them. Rallying them to his side, Conan bade them to mount themselves on the half-wild horses of the hill tribesmen and join him in a cavalry charge Thespides' fallen knights would have envied. Poultry though their numbers might have been, surprise and the momentum of their steep downhill charge allowed them to tear through the front ranks of their enemies, leaving Kushite, Stygian and Ashuri alike slaughtered in their wake and striking a blow to the enemy's morale. Still, had this charge been unsupported, or had Natok remained on the field to rally his shaken forces, the makeshift knights would likely have simply been drawn into the vast host and cut down, a valiant death in battle the only prize for their mad charge. But whether by luck or Mitra's favour, the charge of these pauper nobles was joined by the delayed attack of Amalric's cavalry, having overcome their foes just in time for the weight of their charge to be added to Conan's. With Natok having abandoned the battlefield, the impact of the mercenary horsemen in the rear of the great leaderless host created instant chaos and panic, a genuine reenactment of the confusion they had previously feigned to bait out Thespides' knights. Despite retaining a vast numbers advantage, the panic and stampeding soon had the horde tearing itself apart, unaware in the confusion of how very few the horsemen who had torn through their lines truly were. As the nomads fled in terror to mount their horses, and Stygians raced for their chariots, the horsemen of Karaja reaped a terrible toll on their fleeing foes, with Conan himself slaying the massive Prince Kutaman in a savage duel among the rout. The bulk of Conan's forces had fallen, but the enemy's losses had been far, far greater, upwards of 40,000 slain by arrows, trampling, or the Karajan spears. Even among his army's defeat, Sugra Koten would make one last bid to win the prize he had truly sought. Amongst the fighting, the princess's pavilion had been all but forgotten, and into this his flying chariot swooped, drawn by a hellish black camel. The last and perhaps most important battle of the day would not be a clash of armies, but the showdown between Lich and Barbarian in the nearby Stygian ruins, ending with the 3,000-year-old scourge ended forever at the point of a thrown sword. Though Thespides had mocked and doubted him, the former mercenary cutthroat had won a great victory in his first command, seeing through their sorcerous foe's tricks and keeping his panicked army from rout when many more experienced generals would have failed. Nor would it be his last. In the years to follow, Conan would fight and lead all manner of forces, as a hetman among the Kazaki Free Companions, as Amra the Lion, the fabled pirate of the Black Coast, and soon as the warrior king of proud Aquilonia. Our series on the history of the Conan universe will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we will catch you on the next one.